What's up, YouTube? Happy Sunday. HGB coming at you from my reading room. I don't think I've ever shot a video in here. Yes, that is a nerdy Star Trek ship and <laughs> a Borg ship. Those exist here, as does the awesome Hi-Fi. Uh, this was like a state-of-the-art Hi-Fi in the 50s, and it cranks. Uh, my favorite thing to listen to jazz on. Got some nice uh, jazz records. I like 50s, 60s jazz. Anyhow, wanted to talk to you today. Um, there was a lot of interest in genetic variation based on your regional adaptations and your ancestral history that may impact your capacity for sustaining a plant-based diet. So I wanted to start the conversation on this. This is just a snippet, but I think for people like myself who failed on veganism, really had problems, or if you are a vegan and you're struggling with certain issues, or if you're thinking about being a vegan, I would highly recommend looking into this stuff before you make that leap. Uh, so today's short conversation is going to be about vitamin A and retinol versus beta carotene. And I can tell you I have read really a ton of papers over the past five days and it is pretty much a can of worms to really get into the biochemistry and the genetics of it. I mean we could do a hundred hour multiple video series and still not cover it all. I just am gonna try to go over some highlights and synthesize some ideas and point you in some directions for your own further research. Okay, let's get started here with the whole idea that the vegan diet may not contain enough vitamin A for you as an individual. So the vegan argument is that you'll convert all you need in beta carotene and that plant foods are in fact rich in beta carotene. And it is true that plants are very rich in beta carotene, and if you eat enough fresh fruits and vegetables, you're going to get plenty of beta carotene. Now, whether or not you'll be able to make use of that is another uh, point that we're going to talk about here today. So throughout the world, um, vitamin A is still one of the nutrients that's of serious concern and causes every year um, up to 500,000 children deaths. Um, and these are places where there are plenty of plant nutrients, so one would think that there would be availability of beta carotene. Um, there are some confounding factors there, like the idea that uh, very impoverished people might be on restricted diets, so they're only eating very nutrient-poor staples, um, normally starches, uh, and there is a big problem with a lack of animal foods. That's one of the factors that they point to as a primary reason for vitamin A insufficiency uh, throughout the world. And this is leading researchers to look at some of the genetics and why this might be a problem because for some time various um, global agencies would just say let's get them more uh, beta carotene rich fruits and vegetables but this did not uh, and does not necessarily take care of the problem. So they are now recommending preformed A supplementation and we'll come back to this in a little bit. So the common argument is that that even though beta carotene has a low conversion ratio to vitamin A that as long as you're eating enough fresh fruit, fruits and veg that you'll get plenty of beta carotene, you'll have no problems with vitamin A and that actually vitamin A could be super toxic and is scary. Uh, you shouldn't be eating that because we're not true carnivores. Here's the thing, research is really not backing that claim up. In fact, more and more Research now with new technology is emerging to show that there are specific phenotypes to vitamin A called low responders or low converter phenotypes. And uh, in one research it showed that up to 45% of the volunteers, and this was um, not just in one country, it had multiple countries that they were testing, uh, up to 45% of the people were poor responders. Um, and this should be talked about more openly by vegans that there are genetically people who will not make the plant-based conversions needed to remain healthy on a vegan diet. The type of low responder is a bit complex. 
um, because vitamin A goes through a huge process in the body and it's used all over. So there are multiple proteins in multiple places in that process that someone can have genetic variations. And that can be a difference from conversion or absorption. Um, and there's a number of carrier proteins that research thinks can be targeted for uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms or genetic variations near a gene that can alter your capacity to use beta carotene in your body. And that's not to even get into the conversation of bioavailability. So there are a number of studies that have shown that there, that fiber in food, which all plant food is based in, um, is very poor at allowing beta carotene to be extracted. So here's now an argument for juicing to pull out the fiber so that you can actually get to the beta carotene. I'm not going to get into that in this video. I'm moving on from here, but I wanted to bring up this point for those who are trying to find problem solving and ways to resolve issues. Juicing might help get more bioavailability of beta carotene. From the research that I read, these are kind of the key critical areas where we now know that there are genetic variations with vitamin A status and bioavailability. Metabolism of vitamin A in the gastrointestinal lumen, apical uptake, intracellular metabolism, and basal lateral secretion of vitamin A by the intestinal cell, regulation of vitamin A absorption, uh, postprandial blood transport of newly absorbed vitamin A from the intestine to the liver, liver metabolism of vitamin A and blood transport of vitamin A from the liver to extrahepatic tissues, vitamin A metabolism in extrahepatic tissues, physiological regulation of blood vitamin A concentrations, genetic variations uh, that modulate blood vitamin A concentrations, uh, and also those associated with fasting blood vitamin A concentrations, which may alter uh, testing, and uh, variations associated with postprandial blood uh, vitamin A concentrations. So that's a lot right there. And here's a summary table of the SNPs that are now known, the mutations that are now known, and the genes that they're associated with. And this list will be expanding as research goes on, but as you can see, there's already quite a few. So in short, what we know that all of these mutations and factors contribute to are the absorption of beta carotene and retinol, digestion, transportation, storage, um, conversion, and then excretion of these compounds. Of all of these, for the sake of the brevity of this video and for other information that I'll get to in a minute, I want to narrow our focus to the BCMO1 gene. That's the beta carotene uh, monooxygenase 1, which is uh, the gene that's responsible for the production of the molecule that catalyzes the reaction that cleaves beta carotene and allows it to be changed into retinol, as seen here by this uh, schematic figure three. Uh, it's well known that there are um, genetic variations in this gene and it is believed that this is a critical genetic variation that can impact your capacity uh, to absorb beta carotene. And they've done studies and they've repeated them and they're showing this, yes, this is the case. So what does that mean for you as a unique human being? Um, there's a lot of arguments that humans are all the same, and on a certain level, I agree with that, but on an evolutionary level, I disagree with that. Um, we have, because we're very clever apes, found ways to circumnavigate the physical selective process for evolution, and uh, you can see by this table here, and this is a table based on beta carotene uh, usage conversion and these are genes uh, and SNPs associated with it and you can see they've started mapping out genotypes based on different ethnic groups and there's 
huge, huge variations. Um, the one that I highlighted goes all the way from zero to 100% sweep in homozygous. So you might not have any of the factors needed to convert certain beta carotene um, you know, molecules. And there's more than, that, than what we've talked about, right? So I think, and this comes back to my argument, that when dietitians, when doctors, when public spokespeople say vegans can get all of the nutrients they need on a plant-based diet is a lie. Some vegans will be able to get the nutrients they need on a vegan diet, and many others will not. And there needs to be more transparency about this. There needs to be uh, better education about this. And, you know, there's a lot of complex confounding factors. Uh, for example, you may be okay or even adequate at using beta carotene, but perhaps you have a zinc deficiency. Zinc deficiency or low zinc values are very common in vegans and, and they are especially common in male vegans. So it's well known by research that zinc deficiency can interfere with your capacity to metabolize beta carotene. So how can you deal with understanding where your problems are at? You could also have misdiagnosis with thyroid dysfunction. And I have been contacted by an inordinate amount of people with elevated uh, TSH hormones. I myself tested high as a raw vegan with TSH. So thyroid, hypothyroid or hyperthyroidism uh, both seem to occur with people on raw vegans or vegan diets. And that could actually be a vitamin A or an incapacity to use beta carotene, but you could get misdiagnosed, put on medications, and still not be using your beta carotene as you need to to stay healthy. So what does this mean? What can we do about it? What's a good approach for sort of problem solving with deficiency, with problems that arise, uh, whether or not you are gonna come back to eating meat but as a vegan, you want to continue on, or maybe you want to experiment with being a vegan. Here's what I recommend. So what do I actually recommend is problem solving? Well, first of all, if you are in nutritional crisis right now as a person on a restricted diet, and you are having problems with your thyroid, or you are having problems in general with your teeth or your hormones, I'd recommend getting into a stop-loss situation. And what I mean by that is you get some emergency supplementation in there until you figure out what step you want to take next. So I would work with all of your preformed fat-soluble vitamins. So get preformed K2, a little bit of preformed A, um, D, E, and preformed long-chain fatty acids and make sure that your mineral content is high enough. So your zinc, your selenium, your calcium, um, those are big ones there, and your iron as well. Uh, whether that comes in the form of, you know, microgreen powders or a vegan, you know, a full-spectrum vegan supplement, whatever it takes. Um, I, as you know, am sort of against supplementation but I think it has a place as a stop-loss mechanism. I don't think that they're good to take long-term. I don't think that they are better than food. And I've gone into that a number of times. But there's another thing that you can do, and I highly recommend this. I'm doing it, and I think that it would help a lot of people better understand themselves and what they need to do to actually find optimum health, and that's genetic testing. So now genetic testing is cheap. Like when I first started looking into it, it was like $1,500. But the new technology that they have for doing genetics is so advanced that they're able to really drop the price down. It's 100 bucks to get your 23andMe Ancestry done. And that also gives you a raw data file. Uh, for like 50 bucks more, you can get more information about 
what diseases you might be susceptible to, but that's something that I'm just not interested in. But what you can do with that raw data file is you can send it to, I don't know if it's straight gene or strat gene, but it's this guy in this company and what they've done is they've done the research to look into all of these nutritional uh, variations in genes and mutations in genes and including the one that I highlighted here, the BCM01, uh, they can tell you what kind of allele carrier you are. So they go down through it, they do a report for you, it's $45, and they look at all your genetic mutations and what that might mean for you on a nutritional level. And they invite you to a Facebook group, it's a private group, where you can talk more about it and strategize on how you can optimize your health, your nutrition, and your genetics with this information. And I think this is super cool, and I think every person that wants to go vegan should do this first and understand what it means for them. And I think that this is just in its nascent form. This is going to be like the, the future of nutrigenomics, of being able to look at your genetics and really know what you're good at what you're not good at and not just experimenting and putting yourself in a situation as I myself and many others have <laughs> endless times where you're trying to you know find that health and you're trying to do these protocols that so-called gurus are saying are the best for everyone and then you do them and you do them to the T and you don't do well well there's a reason you're not a bad person you have your own individual genetics alright this is the end of this video Post questions, hit thumbs, let me know what you think. I have a few others that are like this that I'm going to put up that are kind of what I think are critical factors in why genetically people fail on plant-based diets.